Well, the idea to Summit Everest came about because uh, a client that I had been working with for the last few years, a guy named Effie Gilder, local Aspen guy, uh, we'd been skiing together and we started kind of climbing some of the seven summits together, started with Denali up in Alaska, and he uh, has gotten in really good shape and gotten really kind of motivated, and so the idea of sort of finishing the seven summits um, was proposed, and of course Everest being the highest, and all of a sudden spring 2011 is, is here, and we've, uh, we've gone to Everest and, and achieved the goal. Before I went there, certainly I had um, ideas or a certain perception of what the mountain would be like just from the things that you hear in the media and you know books like Into Thin Air that you read and I sort of had this idea that it would be crowded and maybe the, I didn't think the climbing was that spectacular because I hadn't heard that much um, but what what really surprised me when I was over there was that okay yeah there was a lot of people there's a lot of the human factor and some drama going on but the actual beauty of the place and the quality of the climbing was just superb and so when I was on that summit ridge at sunrise, at, you know, 4.30 in the morning, the sun's coming up over Tibet. I was just uh, many, many times thinking to myself, wow, this is the coolest place in the world right now. I, I think the quality of the climbing on Everest really lives up to the, f the highest peak in the world. It's, it's certainly worthy. Well, I think the biggest challenge there is keeping your head in the game just mentally because it's such a long, drawn out process of trying to summit Everest and there's a lot of downtime. You're not up there climbing every day. You know, you have these long rest periods between your rotations up the mountain and, and you have to stay focused and it's really easy to get distracted and people pull the plug. People get, you know, a month into it or six weeks into it and they, they leave because they just can't take it anymore. You know, they're not used to living in a tent for that long. and and eating maybe that kind of food and everything is a little bit foreign and so I like to for myself and for my clients sort of take one step at a time and have these little goals okay tomorrow we're gonna to try to accomplish this and the next day and the next week and pretty soon once you've accomplished all those little goals the big goal of the summit is in reach and then you get that and you get yourself back down but you just yeah take it one step at a time or put one foot in front of the other I like to say pretty soon you're at the top One of the really interesting stories about our trip to Mount Everest this year was that Neil Beidelman was along. Neil's a uh, born and raised Aspenite and he has been a professional climber and has achieved great things in the, in the sport of mountaineering in his career and he's an engineer here in Aspen but he's a world-class athlete. In 1996 he went to Everest and was caught up in the disaster which we've come to know as the Into Thin Air um, tragedy. You know, John Krakauer wrote the book about it uh, and Neil was uh, you know, extremely involved in saving people's lives and really is an unsung hero from that, that 96 uh, tragic trip. We, we talked a lot about what went on then, how things were different now, and for him to come back now 15 years later on different terms in this kind of guiding situation versus when he was there uh, before, I think was really nice. It was, there was more freedom now, he didn't have quite the same amount of responsibility, I think, as he did back then. And I don't think there was as much commercial pressure now as there was back then as well. And so it was pretty fun, pretty relaxing for him. And, uh, and we had a, a really good time. And summit day, I was sitting at the top and, and Neil came up a few minutes later and sat down next to me and just basically started crying. Like the emotions of 15 years of kind of having a monkey on his back really from that 96 trip uh, all came out on the summit. We, we kind of embraced and we're like, we were on the top, man, we did it. And it was, it was cool. We were like brothers up there. It was, uh, it was really fun to share that experience with Neil. I remember those early days trekking in at 12,000, 13, 14, you're really feeling it and you're kind of going slow. The peaks are so big, it's, you're just, yeah, I mean, I said this in the local newspaper, I was overwhelmed by it all. When you're moving through the Kumbu Icefall, which is this sort of jumbled maze of falling ice and seracs and crevasses and you're climbing over ladders and things, it's really sort of surreal. It's, it's, it's unlike any um, landscape you might have seen anywhere else in the world. And uh, you kind of get used to moving through it and it becomes sort of routine, but you can never take it for granted. These things are dangerous. Fortunately for us, we were pretty safe. Uh, we didn't have any accidents or any problems doing that. By early May, we've done some rotations up on the mountain to acclimatize, gone up to Camp 2 at 21,000, Camp 3 at 23, 24,000 feet. 
We come back down, we're resting, waiting for Mother Nature, waiting for our summit window. Um, traditionally, in the, around the second and third week of May, there's a sort of a break in the jet stream before the monsoon comes from the Bay of Bengal, and that's the window of opportunity when there's low wind up there and the temperatures are right. And uh, sure enough, May 19th and 20th were looking perfect. So we moved up the mountain to the South Coal, to Camp 4, uh, in position, ready to go. And it was snowing and it was windy. Uh, the conditions weren't perfect. Mother Nature, the mountain, was talking to us and saying, hey, you know what, maybe turn around. So we did. We went back down and we spent another day uh, at the South Pole, which is 26,000 feet. It's pretty high and it's tough on your body. You can kind of feel yourself wasting away up there. I mean, it's the death zone. But we, uh, we waited for another 24 hours and we went again on the, on the 20th. And that night was perfect. The stars were out. There was no wind. It was about 20 below zero, so a little cold at, at night. But we had a really good climb. And, and just a few hours later, the sun was coming up. And uh, it was just perfect. I was on the summit with my gloves off, my oxygen mask off, just enjoying every moment of it. And we were you know, really celebrating. But the top is only halfway you got to get yourself back down. So we really made sure that we were uh, safe and took our time getting down. And it wasn't until we walked into base camp a couple days later that we knew we had done it. And you know, we were through the Kumbu Icefall, we were through the dangerous sections, and that's when we really started celebrating. So even going to Mount Everest, which is a climber's mountain, you don't hear a lot about skiing there. Even going there, I wanted to bring skis. So Neil Beidelman and I, we had our skis along. If the opportunity arose and there was good snow, we were gonna try to ski. Sure enough, I've had some great luck in the last few years. The snow came, we were up at camp two, and the Lhotse face was covered with like 10 inches or a foot of new snow, and it was sticking to the ice underneath. And we went up there and we skied one of the most beautiful powder runs of my life on uh, one of the biggest faces in the world, and it was just truly stunning. And so I think for us as a group and as a team, the experience of summiting Everest was made that much better in the fact that we got to ski. And all these other hundreds of people, other teams that were on the mountain, they didn't. They might have summited, but they didn't get to ski. So that kind of set us apart, which was really cool. For me, it's been a lifelong you know, experience kind of leading up to this. I've sort of been born and raised in the mountains and it's what I do. So uh, going to Everest was kind of just, I, I think it felt kind of just like another mountain, even though it's the highest one and it's a long trip. Uh, you know, my whole life has been sort of you know, leading up to things like this and opportunities like this. And now anything's possible. Yeah, what's next? That's the, I'm going to Hawaii this weekend. That's what's next. I'm gonna go stick my toes in the sand. Mm -hmm.